Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you to raise the bar on your own performance and to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's episode. Greetings, everyone. This is Hugh Ballou back for another really good session of the Nonprofit Exchange. I got the best job. I get to interview great people who've got a great story, have great passion for creating good. Today, it's about philanthropy, but it's expanded in an area I think you'll be very interested in. So the guests today are, are Jay and, and how do you say your name? I'm so sorry. Shira. Shira Ruderman. And they are from, they're coming in from Boston, Massachusetts. So tell folks a little bit about who you are and why you're doing this and a little bit about your foundation, please. So Shira and I come from very different backgrounds. Uh, I'm a Bostonian. I grew up here, um, went to college and law school in the area, became an assistant district attorney, was very interested in politics and really wanted uh, in the beginning of my life to give back through politics. And then along the way, I, I think I became a little bit jaded about politics, seeing is that it's mostly about uh, raising money. And um, philanthropy is not something that I think most people um, say, okay, I'm going to start a career in philanthropy. It sort of happens along the way. So I had done many different things in my life, but um, my dad decided to start a foundation. Um, I've always been involved in the social sphere. And he asked me to, to jump in and, and get involved. And initially I thought philanthropy is very sort of passive and, and just giving um, to causes. But over the years, we've developed a very activist form of philanthropy and, and advocacy. And that's a little bit about my background. Maybe Shira would like to talk about where she's from. Yeah. So um, Shira Rudiman, I was born in Israel and I met Jay. We got married and uh, moved to the States. Prior to that, my background is in management and strategy. And I uh, love public policy, was always uh, extremely involved and engaged with uh, public policy and run for offices. Um, and I think as Jay described, like our different backgrounds uh, brought us together to appreciate and understand the power in change that philanthropy brings to our society. And from believing in public policy and understanding family values, I think we were able to bring this to the foundation's world and literally create from scratch uh, the view, the vision, and the implementation that the Ruderman Family Foundation has today. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So um, the foundation, did you start this? Is Was this the one that your dad started? Well, it's it, my dad started the idea of a foundation, but it was sort of on paper and a what what I would call a checkbook foundation. Uh, basically, you know, uh, a fund of of money and people would come to him and he would write checks. It wasn't until Shira got involved that it really became professionalized. And then, you know, I came in several years later, and now we're an organization with offices in Boston, New York, and and in Israel, and we really operate on a global scale. Uh, but that's over. You know, we've been working. Um, as an organized foundation for um, approximately 20 years. So a lot has gone in, you know, within that period of time. Amazing. So rather than just focusing on fundraising, the Ruderman Family Foundation is the name of it. You, you're actively devoting your existence to problem solving, advocacy, social justice, and other things. Tell us a little bit about what that means and why that's important. First, I think it's important to know we do not do fundraising. We are an independent uh, family that had dedicated mean to the public goods in under a foundation um, structure. So we do not do fundraising and we actively create social change strategy uh, based on our passions, values and abilities to make change in certain areas. The areas that we chose to work on uh, inclusion of people with disability for the last 18 years, mental health in the last uh, six years, 
strengthening the relationship among um, American Jewry and the state of Israel and strategic philanthropy. So on that specific areas, we decide what is the change that we wanna see in the upcoming years and how we can best manifest that by concentrating um, and our strategy so far has in the method, as you mentioned, few elements. One is traditional grants, which we uh, approach the organizations we want to work with. We decide what is the change we want to do with them and decide on a partnership. We run a few of our internal programs. Um, but I think most uniquely about us is the fact that we do a lot of advocacy and raising awareness which means we create content, create white papers, research, surveys. We do campaigns on social media and traditional media. We targeted uh, issues that we want the public to be aware with and creating engagement, engaging opportunities uh, through pledge, through um, petitions, through campaigns, through celebrities and influencers. Um, and we heavily think constantly how we can change perception and decrease stigma in the case of inclusion and mental health. And by that, we choose every time the best ways and the best platforms to get engaged. Do you want to add something? I mean, the, the foundation is an ever evolving organization. I mean, we really started out in Boston, focused on the Jewish community. Um, she was from Israel. I lived in Israel. We raised a family there. Um, we, we married our two concepts, which was uh, investing in disability inclusion. Um, another issue that Shira mentioned, which was um, educating Israelis about the American Jewish community. Basically, Amer uh, Jews are, are about 80% of the Jewish population is split between the United States and Israel, and yet they really don't understand each other. So when we can find an area where there is a need, but there's really a vacuum in leadership, that's where we jump in. And that's where we've had a lot of success. And since then, the foundation is really involved into um, supporting innovative programs in different communities, but also in advocacy. So we're very outspoken in the media. And we feel that we, by doing that, we amplify what we're, uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So let's, um, let's hone in. When we talk about diversity or inclusion, I guess would be better. When we talk about inclusion, you mentioned disabilities. That's one in four people in our population. Right. And I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. Yes, I mean, that the statistics are one in four people has some form of disability. Uh, they're generally the poorest people in our society and the most segregated people in our society. And I don't want to go through a whole history lesson, but you know, not going back all that far, people with disabilities were segregated, were institutionalized. And it's only recently in the past few decades where people with disabilities, especially after the passage of the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, are more included in our, our society, but yet the unemployment rate among people with disabilities is about 70%, which is way off the national average. Um, and a lot of that comes from stigma. So we spent a lot of time trying to break down stigma um, and addressing that in different ways. We put out white papers that deal with different aspects of society that we really feel can get people to think differently. And then finally, we sort of stumbled into getting involved in Hollywood and first as a critic and now as a partner in, in changing um, the way disability is seen um, on the small screen and the big screen. Um, and we feel that through cultural change, you can really change the way people view other people and the way they act towards other people. So that's um, philanthropists are in fact change makers, right? Absolutely. I think philanthropy is an absolute uh, power uh, and a partner to make a change in society. You know, I think that most times we, we think of philanthropy as uh, those that represent the funds. I think that what we're trying to bring to the conversation of philanthropy is to show that you can represent funds, but also have 
a goal and an expertise uh, as a professional and help the sectors you work with to reach the change uh, that is, um, is needed because one of the gifts that philanthropy can bring is the power of money, but money is not enough to make a change. You need the policymakers, you need the public to believe in it, you need the professionals to be able to execute that. Therefore, it's important to understand that the change maker that we advocate for in the name of philanthropy cannot be done just by funding it, is by getting involved, by bringing people together, by creating a trust in the field, by creating holistic approach, theory of change. So people are committed and motivated to be part of the change and not just responding to the dollar sign. Very well stated. <laughs> There's somebody watching this who's doing a happy dance about that, I'm sure. Um, a specific person. So um, it's it's really, um, we're change makers, but it's what you're describing for me is a transformative process, transforming our thinking. And I, I've worked with uh, lots of sizes of nonprofits and social entrepreneurs for almost 33 years. And there's a whole lot of interest in doing good things, but the connecting as a, as a musical conductor, my, my skill set is connecting strategy, which is words on paper or dots like music, connecting that and, and integrating it into performance. So how do you help people? There's an education piece to this, I believe, because I think when people don't do something, it's lack of knowledge primarily, or they object to something. And there's a lot of well-meaning people that think they want to do something, even write goals, but we don't have measurable impact. So talk about the education and talk about creating measurable results, the impact, would you please? So I, first of all, I, th I think that Shira and I, as leaders of the foundation, play very different roles. Um, my role is sort of, I would say, a vision of how society can change and, and the push points that, that we need to um, go after in terms of really having systematic change in society. Shira is much more focused on the strategy and the and and the and the plan to get us there. Um, so often, you know, I'll have a goal and I'll be like, "Yeah, I want to really change the conversation in Hollywood," and then I'll turn to her and I'll be like, "How do we do that?" So I think we complement each other, um, but I I think you know, you, you, there's a lot of talk about in in our society about laws and passing laws and laws that will change you know lives. And, and I don't want to discount anyone who goes into public service or, or any legislative um, or executive branch because I think they really do change lives. But if you don't change attitudes, then I don't care what law you pass, the law is not going to be successful. People are not going to understand it. And there are you know, inherent stigmas. And, and the issue that we chose, which was disability rights, there were inherent stigmas. People thought people with disabilities were not as qualified to work, that they, can't, they couldn't live on their own, that they couldn't be part of the community. That's a long-term process through different programs of changing societal attitudes. And we're doing it on mental health. There's many different areas where, where we're trying to look at different communities and change the way they're thinking we work with with the religious um, communities um, that, you know, for decades looked at disability a certain way, and we've seen a transformative um, way that people with disabilities are included in religious life. But that's just one example. So I think to add to that, when you say how you educate, first of all, we need to understand that it's a process. Unfortunately, it cannot be done in one action. And it's not, you know, one size fits all because it depends who you're educating, the age, the location, their profession, their background. And in other words, you develop a whole plan uh, that has to answer all or help you to concentrate on what you can make a change in, which even in uh, education or in policy change or in developing new services, which we do all and beyond, we have to identify our limitations and our added value. And more importantly, it's your partners. I think that if any nonprofit 
if you represent philanthropists like us or nonprofit that doing the service and the work on the ground, you have to understand that no one can do anything alone. The issues are too big and the impact is too small if we do not work together. And I think that realization made us from the beginning understand that we want to reach impact versus our, our successes. And, and it's, it's important the understanding because when you want to reach your successes as a nonprofit, you're not thinking about the partnerships. You're thinking, I'm doing what I'm doing very good. No one should change what I do. I know to do it the best. And therefore, if you believe in me, you're going to come with me. That's not the best approach in my mind for a social change maker. We say, you do what you do great. And I want you to do what you do great. But I'm going to bring 10, 15, 20 others that do what they do great. And together, in a holistic, systematic way, instead of reaching million people, we're going to reach 10 million people. And that's the goal. So to educate has few layers. You have to educate in our business of mental health, inclusion. You have to educate professionals. You have to educate um, self-advocates, you have to educate the parents, you have to educate the schools, you have, so therefore you bring different language, different data, different techniques to each one of them, but in the same time, you have to bring it all together. They have to see each other, they have to come across each other. So it's a complementary experience, but at the end, you see the magnitude of the impact. And if I'll summarize to, you know, we many we did uh, inclusion for 18 years. Um, it started 20 years ago, but concentrated work in 18 years. And we said disability is part of diversity before diversity became the key word of what we know today. So today, when people speak about diversity, to them it makes sense. Of course, disability is part of it. But we can show you data and services that 18 years ago, did not include whatsoever people with disability. And it's important because now people feel like they own it, they're part of it, they uh, understand it. And this is the power of education. You lose your credit and success, but you gain everyone's uh, engagement. That is brilliant. Now we'll have this interview transcribed and that whole narrative will be there. There's a number of really critical points there, really good leadership really good focus on results, really good, the synergy of who are we. In the South, we say none of us is as smart as all of us. And, you know, we have our own grammar besides our own words. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and we are better together. You notice the name of our organization is Center Vision. It's the synergy of a common vision. And you just highlighted, we're in such high level of sync. Everything you talked about is the work we do. We do the the, the, the capacity building for the leaders and the boards and the, the structure, the strategy piece. I'm a conductor. You know, our strategy is that piece of paper. We got to have, we got to have the roadmap to get where we're going. So all of that stuff, it just leads me to ask, you know, you are, you are in government, but the, and government has, has a role. There's a really huge role that our, our, our tax exempt communities, the religious communities, the community charities, foundations, membership organizations like Chambers, um, there's a huge role all of those organizations play in the kind of work you're talking about. So talk a little bit more about how, how you inspire people, how you're a catalyst for this change, how you provide tools for people to actually do this stuff. Because I think there's more people that want to do it than have the understanding of how to do it, right? Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say a large part of the economy in the United States revolves around the nonprofit community. It's it's a significant aspect of the workforce in the United States. And I don't think the United States would look as good as it does now with all our problems if people were not dedicated to work in the nonprofit and, and the religious communities. It used to be the third largest employer in America. Right. It is. I think it still is. Yeah. And, and yet it's not talked about because it's, it, they're not as large as a Fortune 500 company or, or you know, um, the attention that elected office gets. But 
they're on the ground, they're really creating the change and they're helping people who are in difficult situations and and especially people in the religious community are dealing one on one with problems that people are facing that that are that are really um uh very important in people's lives so i i have to um really say the the community is very important um but what we've done is for example on the issue of disability we've looked at different communities um, we've issued white papers. We deal a lot with the press. So, for example, probably the most successful white paper we did was a white paper that that the takeaway was that more police and firefighters die by suicide than in the line of duty. And that's a shocking statistic. But unfortunately, since we released that paper, which was several years ago, almost every week there's a firefighter or a police officer someplace in the United States who takes his or her own life. And what we're trying to do is to talk to the police departments and fire departments across the United States saying, you have to deal with the mental health of the people that are working for you and not look at it as a weakness. Because what happens when someone comes forward with a mental health issue in a very stressful environment like a police force their gun is taken away, their badge is taken away, they're put on, on leave. Um, so there's a lot of stress not to come forward. And, and what we're talking through this white paper is like, hey, you have a real issue here. Deal with the mental health of the people that are working for you and the people that are protecting us. And I think it, it has had an impact. I mean, we see our, our research coming up and being introduced into Senate legislation in, in the United States and, and cited by attorneys generals across the United States and in the media all the time. So that's just one example. But what we're trying to do is get people to think differently about a large sector of our society. And, and, and I, I think we're gonna to get to this. This is why eventually we fell into Hollywood, even though we're in Boston and based in Israel and no connections to Hollywood whatsoever, but you know we found our way in there and, and have had tremendous success in changing uh, the discussion in Hollywood. So when people say, oh, I can't make a difference, I'm just a little nonprofit, what do you say to them? First of all, it takes time and persistence. I would say to anyone, to my children, to, to anyone out there, the most important thing, you don't have to be the most talented, you don't have to be the smartest. If you are persistent and you just work and work and work, you're going to have results. You may not see the results in the first month, the first year, the first five years, but you will see results. Um, society rewards persistence. And I think if you stay on message and you're persistent, um, there'll be a lot of setbacks, but there'll be a lot of victories also. And I think you have to savor the victories and, 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 and understand and understand how to uh, connect with people and how to, how to get through. And we have this you know, our society is changing all the time. Social media, which can be a terrible uh, um, influence on our society, can also be a positive influence on our society. So you have to learn how to use different pressure points. Historically, we've worked with the media. I think it's because of my background in politics and understanding what's going to uh, catch on in the media, but we've gotten issues that have been covered across the United States and across the world. I would add to that to say that there are some other values um, that need to be in place. You know, the persistent is the skill and the focus, and then it's our way of working. We also learned that you have to be humbled um, and you have to be, you know, um, sometimes, you know, to develop the listening skill, not less than the speaking skill. And I think it's important because in the nonprofit, like in business, when you speak about nonprofit, philanthropy is nonprofit, but it's a lot of power and it's a lot of powerful people and it's a lot of ego and it's a lot of uh, money. It's not like small, you know, um, ideas that you can solve by just shaking hands. And therefore you have to understand that at times that in order to get your goal done, you have to minimize yourself once in a while. You have to um, take the bigger ideas and bigger principles and put them in the center. 
you also have to understand and it's you know it's a personal preference some people can disagree with me i would say patience it's another skill that is needed you cannot flip things so quickly i know sometimes it feels like we can because things are very um Today, in, as Jay said, in, in, with technology and social media, everything feels very fast, but we already learned and COVID proved it. The fact, the fact that it's fast doesn't mean it's true. And it doesn't mean it's deep. And it doesn't mean it's changing. It just means that people reacting, but under the surface, there is much more that needs to get done. So if we wanna run marathons and social change is a marathon, you have to be patient and you have to be focused and you have to be humbled. But in the same time, as Jay said, you have to be focused and persistent to be successful. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. One thing that Shira said is that you know, humility is a big part of it. In my life, in every career I've had, the, the, the biggest issue that I've come across as a negative force has been ego. Um, and it's very easy to get caught up in, in, in ego, but, you know, if you're humble and if you understand that you are serving a cause, it's not about you, but it's about the cause that you're serving, you won't be as nervous to get up and, and, and speak and talk about what's going on because you're serving a higher cause. And, um, and these causes take time. And I would also say celebrity comes and goes it's those of us that are persistent and um and work throughout our lives to to create change you know we will we may not get the accolades all the time but we will see that we have changed society there's a lot of things people can take down for really good notes it's like sticking with it there's so many people there's the famous story out of napoleon hill's work about the guy that had the gold mine and sold it because he wasn't getting anywhere. And the person that bought it dug three feet and hit the mother load. <laughs> so it's like uh, Greg Reed has the book on three feet from gold. We want to, we want to give up, but we got to stay with it. Right. It's, it's like sometimes people say, Oh, I tried that and it didn't work. I said, yeah, you know, I was going to get fit and I worked out one day last year and it didn't work either. <laughs> So there's a, there's a, there's a commitment to staying with it. So right. you mentioned, um, we got a few minutes left here. I want to, you, you've mentioned uh, mental health along the way. Do you want to give a little more clarity? You, you've also undertaken the mission to end the stigma associated with mental health. That's, that's in addition to the disability piece. Um, and you've expanded that work during COVID. You want to talk a little bit about that as well? Well, I think when COVID first hit, and we all remember because, you know, it was January of, of 2019, 2020 or 2019, um, when, it, when it hit, I mean, the first thing that we thought about was those people on the front lines, our nurses, our doctors, our, our policemen, our firefighters, our EMTs, and, you know, we said we want to invest in them in our community, and we want to support their mental health because, you know, they're just in such a difficult position and, they, and they're serving all of us. Um, I think mental health is important. Mental health often has been seen as a weakness. So um, we have been out front saying we have to be open about our mental health and talk about it and work with different organizations. Now, we also work with celebrities, you know, who've, who've talked about mental health. And, and I believe in allyship and I believe in, in you know, making the synergies. So you know, we've worked with Michael Phelps, the, the you know, famous Olympian. Um, you know, we've worked with other, uh, Tarashi P. Hansen, who's an actress, and, and, and many others who champion mental health, mental health. And we say, great, let's do it together. Let's find a way to, to, to get the message out there. Um, but we also have a lot of services on the ground. Right. So our target, our target um, audience in mental health when it comes to the services and work other than raising awareness is young adults, um, high school and college ages. And around that age, we develop you know, uh, quite a few uh, services that can be scaled pretty much immediately across the country. And if it's a program in high school that as of now is running in like uh, 400 uh, high schools in the United States, six, uh, st six states, 
Um, so we constantly think how we can get a service that's not being given in a scale that can be on the ground and can be multiplied by others pretty quickly. That's, that's the idea. To develop things that are expensive and complex are very problematic. So we're trying to you know, target it, the services that we choose to be involved. We develop a guide for, um, for universities and colleges the first guide ever on campuses in the last few months that target the student in one hand and the faculty in another hand, that it can be a complementary uh, effort on the university side because the number one issues on campuses today are the mental health stresses that students are facing. So we thought, what can be done right now, tomorrow, that can give a support to the student and give a tool to university so kids do not drop due to their mental health. So it's a leave of absence policy. So this is, this is our target audience. We have many, many programs taking place on the ground and we are hoping that in one hand, we're gonna reduce the stigma by campaigns and celebrities and partnership. In another way, we'll you know, scale services because the need is so great out there and use technology to maybe accelerate the, the, the magnitude of it, but also the amplifier of the, how many people today need support. Um, and the professionals are not enough. There's not enough professionals to answer the need. So in short, I can say that, you know, mental health for us, is right now focused on young adults and high school. Um, we're trying to bring the method of awareness, raising awareness and services together and hopefully um, to contribute our share in reducing the stigma and, and bringing some ease to the young adults community. That's huge, that's huge, thank you. You're, you're so articulate and convincing. I can't, any, I can't think anybody that hears you doesn't wanna say yes to whatever you're saying. <laughs> So nothing against you, Jay, but she's, she's so out there with a passion. She's very passionate. I got it. I got it. I'm smarter than I look. All right. so in your notes for me, you said the um, more recently the, the foundation is focused on empowering advocates to affect social change on their own. Can you talk a little bit about that? So, you know, we've been involved for decades on the issue of disability rights. Um, and along the way, um, there's a saying within the disability community, nothing about us without us. And I think society has changed. So if you're going to be an advocate for disability, I think you should be an identified person with a disability. So we began to um, organize a group called Link 20, which are activists with and without disabilities that advocate for um, disability rights. And we funded them and we, and we brought the process along um, and they had some tremendous successes. They were able to contact uh, Major League Baseball and change the historic term, the disabled list to the injured list. Um, because they said, you know, someone who you know, pulls a hand, hamstring playing baseball is not permanently disabled, they're injured. Um, they were able to talk to the U.S. Olympic Committee and say, listen, you're paying Paralympians much less than, than, than Olympians. They were able to get medal uh, uh, pay for, um, uh, okay. for medals, you know, to have, to have parity in, in pay for, for, for medals. So they had some tremendous accomplishments. But I think that that's the future for, so that if we can help start off an advocacy group that then can grow and become their own self-advocates. And we've provided them tools and courses at MIT and, and so forth, that that is the future. And uh, so you always have to have your, your thumb on the pulse of, of like what's happening in, in society. And I just realized that, you know, this was something that was happening and, and we got behind it very early. And, and, you know, I think that this is gonna be the future of uh, disability rights. Awesome. Now, your website is Ruderman, that's R-U-D-E-R-M-A-N, foundation.org. What will people find when they go there? They're going to find um, many things. They're going to find our vision and our mission, our partnerships, our white papers, our research, our campaigns, 
our um, services, everything we do, we try to share um, and make it useful. So we're putting a, together an archive. So every 400 programs that we did in the last um, 15 years, produced and, and, and have either books and uh, booklets and videos, everything can be useful, can be um, accessible to everyone that in the field, then we would like to save people, you know, I call it the time and the money and to not, re, not to reinvent the wheel. So if they go to a website, they're gonna see probably everything their foundation either worked on or supported or partnered or initiated. Um, in the different fields that we work, which is mental health, inclusion, strengthening the relationship in American Jewry and the state of Israel, strategic philanthropy. Um, and we also give an opportunity for people to give us feedback, to give us ideas, to recommend uh, award winners that we give award every year. We ask people to, you know, shoot us an email, let us know who you think deserve it, any uh, um someone that can be interviewed on Jay's podcast. We said we let people, you know, give ideas. We're trying to be good listeners and engaging. And we hope that our website shows it and people will find it useful for anything they do. Yeah, I will mention that uh, there is a podcast I do once every two weeks. It features an activist, all different forms of activism. Uh, some of them, you know, famous like Fran Drescher or Tony Goldwyn. Um, you know, Gina Davis, and some of them not as, as famous, but doing really impactful things in society. So I think activism is the way to go. And we're trying to celebrate that through our podcast. Hey, this is a podcast. We have famous people. We even have Jay and Shira Rudiman. <laughs> yes. So thank you for your time today. You've put a lot of information into a half hour interview. That's just incredible. And to remind people, you can, they're coming by on Facebook, you go to VTHE, nonprofitexchange.org, the nonprofitexchange.org. And you can find this and 300 other podcasts. This one's the top of the pile. This one has a lot of implementable ideas. So Jay and Shira, each one of you, what thought do you want to leave people with today? I would just say, stay, stay encouraged. And, and, you know, this is your life's work and, and, and believe in it. And as Shira said, stay humble, you know, work hard, uh, be persistent. Um, you're needed. You, you know, you might not hear it enough, but you're needed. And, and, you know, I, I commend you for what you're doing. I would uh, say that to your question, if someone wakes up in the morning and tell themselves, can we make a change? Can, can I be the one to start? My answer to that, of course. Uh, big ideas start with good people. And therefore, if you wake up in the morning, I want you to know you can make the change. You should just start it. Instead of talking about it and thinking, just take an action and start. And if you're good and believe in it and passionate, people will believe in you and join you. Um, so that's what I wanna you know, leave behind me as my message to say, do not give up on your dreams. Uh, try to do good in the world. It's worth it. And I hope, um, you know, I hope to be part of it. Well, Shira, thank you. Jay, thank you for being our guest today on the Nonprofit Exchange. This was powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Enjoyed it. Thank you for watching the Nonprofit Exchange.